We're doing it. Yeah, we're good. We're live. Come on, we're man. Live. Oh, Marge still says scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm lagging, man. All right, we're live. Welcome back. Social Kick Podcast. You know the crew. I'm Brian Lundquist, Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, Justin Wynn, and Samakium Cool, Mr. Jason Dunford. What is up, man? Good to see you. It's good to see you all. Thanks for having me on the show. It's good to be here. Yeah, well, I know you by a new name. I'm looking forward to getting into that later. But um, man, it's good, good to see you. What are you? Uh, what are you drinking tonight? So I have coffee cup, and but it doesn't have coffee. In it. it has some good quality Kenyan tea. So when I come back from home, you know, I came back to the U.S. earlier this year. Uh, for people don't know, my wife is from California, so we kind of have been moving between the two hometowns that we both have. Um, and I always come with some Kenyan tea because it's, it's good stuff. It's got this good, strong, black Kenyan tea and it keeps you going. I always have some, you know, towards the evening, get me that last kick for the last few hours. Yeah. Of the day. So that's what I got. Yeah, the black tea will get you going. All right, that's cool. I want to I wanna know more about what I what uh, what sorts of treats we need if I ever visit Kenya. But Yeah, uh, yeah Kenya man. has coffee and it's chocolate, but I know about it's tea, so for sure, yeah, man. Yeah, hell yeah. The tea's that good. sounds awesome. Cool. Uh, Luke, what are you drinking tonight? I got two beers. This one's a... a two, same time. In the weeds. It's not a hazy IPA, but it's not... I don't like it. <laughs> well, I wouldn't double recommend fist in there, it. Luke? I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. It's too hoppy and too sharp. I, I So I've got my backup, which is my beer bottle. I'll have that later. The beer bottle is. This, is. this is decent. You know, you go with things that you know sometimes, right? So. Yeah, 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 I understand. I got the variety in the fridge right now. I'll tell you all about it. John, what are you drinking? Uh, still in the office, so I'm just having some water. Nothing that exciting. You guys oh, go. Oh, we're not going to tell on you, John. Justin, what are you drinking? Well, I'm out of health aid kombucha, so I'm being lame. Bottled water. Well, there's nothing lame about water. People don't drink enough water. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I got a, I got a blue moon tonight. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I like Blue Moon. Simple. I had a blue Moon in a while. But Blue Moon, okay, so Blue Moon, but not with an orange, because don't do that. No, why? <laughs> don't, don't do Coronas with limes and all that stuff. Whoa, Just, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you know, the, I'm not into it. You, you do the Corona with lime. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not into the fruit in the, in the beer. Don't do that. I'm with you there, B. I'm with you there. You know, actually, so the reason why I think that is bar fruit is disgusting. It's never fresh fruit. If it's fresh fruit, then I might go a different route. So if you do it at home, okay, fine. But don't ever do it at a bar because that's gross. <laughs> ever, ever at a bar. Brian's gonna hunt you down and Dude. teach you how to drink a beer. Jason, what's going? What, what's it like going out in Palo Alto when you first moved to California? What's 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 the nightlife like in that scene? <laughs> um, it's not massive, but you know, back in pre-COVID days, we had some good nights there, especially during business school. Um, there's a place called the patio, so you know, did some socializing there. I mean, to be honest, I, I, when I was, I did my undergrad, and then I went to GSP, the uh, Graduate School of Business, and uh, as an undergraduate, I mean, swimming, of course, for many of us college swimmers, is very front and center. And I did, I'm not to say I didn't go out, but you know, it was, it was, I wasn't, you know, going out very much. And then uh, business school was more social, so I, I did get to, you know, experience it more, I suppose. <laughs> And warm up your dance moves. Yeah, business school, uh, that's such a good time in life. I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's tough now with, you know, everything closed up. So I want to take it back, Jason, and ask you about your last swimming race. Yeah. What do you remember about it? I remember not – I remember being relatively satisfied. I wasn't – thrilled but it was actually the final of the 100 fly at the commonwealth games in glasgow in 2014 that was my final race well my final like you know big race i did a few masters things subsequently but like as a as a someone trying to be a top swimmer pro swimmer and uh yeah i, I didn't medal it was an outside shot i kind of already had one foot out of the water for a couple of years i would started working and um yeah so I remember touching the wall and thinking, I think this is my last race. That was good, but I didn't go as fast as I wanted to. And, you know, there was just that kind of that feeling in my life. I don't know. 
both guys have retired, why, why we know in that moment, but I just did. <laughs> I wonder, so this is a discussion I've long had with George, George Bavel about um, the impact of knowing what the next step is on your last swimming meet. And I feel like a mixed bag of athletes say, I knew it was my last meet and they swam great. And then there's some people that knew it was their last meet and that wasn't good because they knew that there was a safety net on the back end. That's the way that George was. He said, like, I didn't want to think about anything after that. It's like the meet is on X date and it doesn't matter what's happening after, you know, it's kind of, so I don't know. Do you feel like that had an impact on your performance in your last meet? I, to be honest, going in, I didn't know it was going to be my last meet. You did. I didn't catch the question quite well, but yeah, I'll tell you my experience. So, um, I thought I was going to go for another cycle all the way to 2016. Um, you know, in London, I had not I'd had a disappointing race. So I didn't do as well as I had. I did worse than in Beijing, and I thought I had more to give. So that's why I would kind of kept going for half the cycle till 2014, and then um, yeah, I thought 2016 would be the would be it, and I was going to go through one full cycle. But you know, the races just really didn't go. And I just got married at that point, and I felt you know I started feeling like okay. This, this, my life is starting to move on in some ways, personally as well. So, um, yeah, it was just, I mean, of course, it was it was really hard those first few months. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> hard when you, when you stop. Yeah, I think the, well, especially having had the opportunity to talk with a lot of um, swimmers that are post-career, you know, we've, we've had some discussions about what it's like to transition through that period and, uh, you know, it's almost universal that people experience hardship. I can remember asking my college coach, David Marsh, who was a really accomplished coach, but also a really accomplished swimmer in his days. Hey, does coaching do for you fill the sort of competitive spirit, the outlet of, you know, developing mastery that, you know, you, you achieved with doing the sport itself mm -hmm. and, you know, he said no. It, coaching never fulfilled for him what actually swimming and doing the athletic activity did. I mean, he's so close and connected to the sport. But, you know, I wonder about that for somebody like you who has navigated that path and found success in other areas in life. Do you feel like you've moved on to find success then that has brought out a fulfillment in you that maybe was hard to find for a little while? But yeah. um started to feel like, you know, your identity is not just Jason Dunford, the Olympic swimmer, you know, yeah. it's, now it's all these other things. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the first part was incredibly hard because, you know, you, once you've got to that level and you're feeling, you know, that feeling of what's next, <laughs> that's the thing with being an athlete. You, if, if you get to a peak level, you, you, you've had a full career at a very, at a very young age that's come to an end. And it took a lot of introspection. I was, I lucky I had my wife as a very solid support system through that. She was there for me when I was having a tough time and figuring it out. And I, you know, I, I took I, my first couple of jobs post swimming were good, were good jobs. I enjoyed them, but I always felt for me, a lot of it was this feeling of wanting to be connected back to where I'm from again, back to Kenya, because swimming had kept that, even though it was here in the U S and in California, you know, I was kind of representing, my my hometown my country and uh that that was so fulfilling to me and then i go on these international trips and meet all all the other kenyans and athletes etc and we were vibing so i was very connected to kenya and i wanted to use the amazing platform i had been given as a as someone representing kenya in the pool and doing the stuff i did no doubt i i, I worked hard I, I i committed to the sport big time but you know I, I felt very lucky and blessed to be supported in the way i was by kenya as a as a nation and uh i wanted to do something i felt this pull i wanted to go because you know kenya has a as an emerging economy there's a lot to do i mean there's a lot to do here in the us as well don't get me wrong but i felt i was uniquely placed to be able to navigate some things like that. But I just couldn't figure out how that was gonna work now. Cause you know, I was here, I was, I was in a comfortable life with my wife. We had, you know, we had good steady jobs. We we're moving up in the corporate world. And it, I, I, we have a few mentors that we had from university. So any, and this is a good advice for anyone still in college, try to develop 
relationships with your professors and and get some mentors early on because they can be so valuable to help you think through your life path later and it was one particular professor who saw what i was doing he's like okay you're now in the business world you might want to think about doing an mba and he's the one who really prompted me to apply to go back to graduate school and be a, a student again without that pressure of swimming as an athlete because for us as athletes during college it can be really hard to find that balance you know there's so many demands on your time from the sport that oftentimes i mean not to say i didn't work hard academically but you know sometimes i was uh, maybe you know you kind of you don't think as hard maybe about what it is you're exactly doing in that space in that moment because swimming is so front and center so to get to go back and do my MBA was a real chance to really introspect, really commit to my studies, but also explore entrepreneurship, which I I thought about going in to do first and entrepreneurship in Kenya, because I was in touch with people that are starting companies. And I was like, seems to be a lot going on. There's a lot of energy, you know, it's a young population. There's demand for services, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to, and you know, it's kind of a center of tech for the region, you know, it's termed the Silicon Savannah. So I went with all these hypotheses and, uh, kind of led to a journey during business school, which I can get into in more detail if it'll be interesting, but that was kind of life-changing for me to be able to have those two years in that program and, and really commit to some different things. When were those two years, Jason? You started the MBA in 2014, yeah? 2016 to 2018. 2016, 20, so, I mean, arguably your, one of your best years in swimming was 2008, yeah? You went, you went your best time and I mean- nine ten was- 2008. Right, so, so you're Commonwealth champion in 2010, you were two places away from a medal in 2008. I mean, you, you were tearing up. Fourth in the world champs in 2011. Fourth exactly. in the world champs. I mean, I so you, I got to a medal. You were tearing it up, um, yet you're still going to school. So you still had the distraction of, of a Stanford, a hmm. very tenuous you know, degree to, to, to focus on. Um, John, and you and I watched that documentary last night, The, the Weight of Gold, mm -hmm. and talking about that, you know, all, all those athletes knew was, the, all they knew was the athlete. They didn't know, they weren't recognized as a human. Um, yeah. You know, Michael talks about that a lot in the documentary last night. He was just known as a swimmer, right? Who achieved, but he was, he wanted to be known as a human. Do you think that funnily enough, being in Stanford and having, you know, the circle of friends in your undergrad and you, and you did two undergrads, didn't you? No, um, I did a master's, an MS master's. in MS. It's a I think that helps you be more rounded and, and just be a little bit more, help buffer a little bit more the fact that besides just Jason, the Olympic athlete, in, in those years, right off, like 11, 12, those years. Absolutely. It still made it, they were, I mean, it's still hard, even with that. And I think I, I was lucky, I was lucky, I worked hard for it too, to commit to my studies as I did, but, um, they, you know, still hard, the identity of, of being a swimmer. But, you know, I had a very interesting experience about thinking about the identity of a swimmer and how it started becoming almost a burden to me, I felt, later on. It was like, but I thought that was all my mental state. It should never be a burden. It's how can you use it to your advantage in whatever scenario you're in. Mm -hmm. And it really took actually being in the business school program where, <laughs> I mean, I can't believe I get to tell the story, but I got very lucky to take a class on personal branding you know we all now have our personal brands with the ubiquity of social media and mm -hmm. you know you, you've really you've got to be proactive in 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 not you know in telling your story as well because otherwise if you let people tell it for you it can often be very wrong and they won't get all the details right and they might portray you in a way that is not correct and not how you want to be portrayed and with this this class was actually taught by a professor called Alison Kluger, a marketing professor, but we had a guest lecturer in Tyra Banks. She was yeah. the guest lecturer in the class. And learning on, from her about what it takes to build your personal brand and thinking about um, blending everything that you've had in your history into that brand and how can it be part of what you do going forward was a huge learning. And it suddenly kind of turned my mind like, yeah, the swimming thing has kind of felt heavy. Like everyone's just like, you're the swimmer, you're the swimmer. Like, yeah, and then you should use that. Yes, I am the swimmer, but I'm also, these are some other things that I, I'm also into and be start using it. it well, not using it, but, you know, blending it all together. So, it's interesting you say that, Jason. And again, last twisting. Go ahead, sorry. I yeah, the, the term was brand, twisting your different elements of your brand. And it can apply to your, your company as well. Like what are those okay. elements you twist together to create the whole? Yeah. 
I was going to say that last night they talked about you know this 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 guy was seemingly they, they focused on a freestyle down a skier right John and um, he was always like you know, he was always friendly and funny and laugh and you never think that he would commit suicide he was completely depressed um, Jason I I met you around that time I think I don't recall and I yeah. I didn't know you as the swimmer I got to know you as a friend I got we went surfing together I know you went spear yeah. fishing you brought back some butt ugly fish to my house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And you're so proud. No, and, and and I got to know your brother David as well. And you you're very close to David. And, yeah. and David had very some experience to you coming across as well. So yeah. you had, you seemingly had like, you know, I didn't know I met your your girlfriend at the time, now wife Lauren. Yeah. And you seem so well adjusted and such a solid, down to earth, chill guy. Yeah. Yeah, you were going through some not so fun stuff at that time, right? You just don't know, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. And that you were catching me in the escape time, right? The weekends when I just used to, and I, it was a time when I was living for the weekend, right? The week just felt like a slog. And I was, I was talking like, wow, is this, you know, is this going to be the rest of my life? The week's going to be a slog and I'm just living for the fun and the hobbies and the weekend. And, you know, I, I kind of remind myself that, okay, that's not, I'm so privileged. I'm so lucky with everything I have. I cannot, and what I've already done in my life and been given and, all the blessings in that but uh and it took it took this professor who actually snapped me out of it it's like what do, you, what do you want what do you want next what can you do what further impact you you know that was kind of a big change for me yeah yeah i had a similar experience when i was fi you know finishing up at Purdue swimming and was in entrepreneurship or minored in it as well and had a professor kind of like you said just kind of post some some confidence in myself that hey you can do other things as well it's not just all about sport you can get in other activities there's plenty of time in the day so i do think like you said developing these mentors or talking with your professors and just realizing like you said there is more to each person uh, than obviously just your identity and your sport and trying to build that up and obviously with social media that's one way to do it but what are some other ways that you think people can you know grow or try to find their other avenues to fulfill themselves as a person? Well, I think um, for me, it started being like, I'm interested in this. I, I was lucky with the MBA. I got to try a, diff a few different things and, you know, without that, um, you know, feeling that, well, you still have that feeling. That fear of failure is always there. <laughs> so it's how can you, I guess, manage the risk of trying something different um, and then build it to a place where you can maybe do it full time, pursuing your passions to do it. I think George is making a comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just popped up and distracted me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, my most recent thing is, is music. Obviously I'm not music. I'm sitting in the studio I've been building in this quarantine time since I got back to the US in, a, in like an old book. I said it's pretty much ready as George just commented. And I didn't really know when I started doing music, I was actually working as a journalist, broadcast journalist um, for BBC on the Africa business team. And I thought that was it. I was set in my life. Me too, yeah. yeah. There. But I started doing music. I got invited to do a song. And I was like, I don't know about music. That just seems like really left. That, that's a real left turn right now. I don't know if I could really make that happen. And this guy who's, um, he goes, Edgar Gallegos, but he goes by Romantico, who's, who's a... <laughs> Who's a, who's a Mexican rapper in Nairobi. And I discovered this guy on the radio. I'm like, what? who is this guy? What's he doing here? And it, he'd come over originally as a missionary before getting into the music scene in in Nairobi. So I thought this was fascinating from a journalistic point of view. Let me see. And he invited me to do a song he, when we first met. We kind of vibed. He said, you should come to the studio. And I was like, okay, I'll come to you. Maybe I'll do a story about you. And he's like, and then he said, no, no, you should write some lyrics, see what you can do. I was like, fine. Let's try this. And so from there, we like, released our first song. And this was all on the side of my regular nine to five job at BBC. You know, so I was doing a lot of things. So I started in that and it, it kept growing to a point where, and I was enjoying it. I'd go on weekends, I'd, you know, sometimes before work, we'd go to the studio and then I'd head to work. And before we know it, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting called to do collaborations with a lot of big artists in Kenya, then in Africa, then we get international artists calling from Spain. You know, we just released, we're well, just uh, finalizing a release with a Grammy winner out of Spain called Antonio Carmona. Wow. So things just sort of growing, but it was kind of pursuing it on the side. So I was kind of doing my risk mitigation. Where I was like, I'm not going to launch into this full on right now because that 
so uh, I mean, it's you know, it's hard enough. You know, music's not an easy industry, and uh, I was trying it. But I thought, why not? Let's go. Through. So it's part of like seizing those opportunities when they come along, and kind of you know, they they will come along, and you <laughs> might turn them. I could have better easily said, absolutely no way. I'm not even going to try this rapping thing. Would you? And uh, you know. Maybe trying to do it on the side of what you're doing and what's your your part right now, and who knows where it morphs and what, how, what it becomes. So, Jason, I want to get into this. Yeah, go ahead. I want to get into this because we have a special guest coming up at the end. But I want to take it back to something you said, and the fact that George came on is it was an interesting segue. So yeah, you didn't have the supposedly all that pressure. You had ninety nine percent of it, but people don't realize who you were in Kenya. Um, you know, you you were awarded the President's Award of the Grand Warrior. You were the, the Kenyan flag bearer. You yeah. were you were chosen as the flag bearer at the Olympics for the Kenyan Olympic team. Yeah. You you were I mean uh, you're the only Kenyan Olymp um, Olympic finalist in swimming. Yeah. I mean I mean so there was a you were known in Kenya as a swimmer. You were there, and, and George has the same idea in Trinidad. There's a white boy who can swim. Yeah. And uh, honestly, straight up, right? Being fact. So there was a lot of pressure in your own country, and people have to re realize that context. Talk about swimming in Kenya. Swimming, I mean, you you were there until 13. You, your formative years was swimming yeah. in, in Nairobi, yeah. um, and then representing on the international scene, you and your brother. I want to, don't forget David, what he's done, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it, it's uh, a developing sport. It's a pretty good youth swimming team. Obviously, I mean, in, in normal times, and I, I, we do hope we get back to those times. But uh, there's a lot of young talent, but there's not a very, a very good system to develop swimmers to the highest level. And, uh, you know, we were the first two to qualify the Olympics, but we've had other swimmers go overseas and um, get trained in South Africa and England and other colleges in the US. No one had ever quite got to the level we did, um, but people got, you know, relatively high. You know, we've had some guys from many Commonwealth semi-finals and stuff so you know there, there was there was a sense of improvement and i still think there is no one's quite got to the level we we were able to get to yet but i do see some potential and um you know there's not there's not a lot of facilities that's a challenge i mean pools are expensive to keep upkeep there's 350 meter pools in the whole country right um and then various states of repair at any given time the main one is that we've got a really nice facility uh, called kasarani mm -hmm. where we do a lot of our facility and you know it's it's a it's a good facility but it, it the business model to run it as a sustainable enterprise has not so it, it relies kind of on government funding which can be um tenuous at the best of times and so that's problematic so a lot a lot of the swimming will happen in the private schools and oftentimes you know it's how do you develop the sport to make it accessible to more of the kids in the country. Yeah, don't you think it's a cultural thing too, Jason? Like they truly didn't have the belief that a Kenyan can excel at swimming. Like who would have thought somebody from Trinidad could win a medal? Are you, no way. Certainly. And now, so yeah. you now have given them that hope that no, you could, you can, and it can yeah. happen. Do you think the systemic? I, you know, when I was back, I've been in Kenya the last two years because I was, I, we launched the business with my wife there and then, you know, did my, did some journalism and then got into music. And I also, as part of that, did a lot of speaking to groups of uh, kids in, in the swimming community. And there is that belief. Like when I was a kid in Nairobi and, you know, it, it wasn't even a concept that you could one day swim in the Olympics. But now I've got kids who like see me and they're like, yeah, I want to be, you know, I want to swim in the Olympics too. So there's, I, we certainly, what we did, I think we did open eyes to the possibility of what you can do. And then, and then also try to break down that barrier that, because parents are also concerned that if a kid starts to really get into their swimming, then the academics is going to disappear and they'll now have no life beyond the sport. And it's so also, you know, helpful that we, we try to change that mind as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, what I mean, to that point, what is it about your uh, environment, um, your upbringing, your personality type that was the kind that's going to forge that path? Because if that foundation didn't exist for you, you had to navigate it and then ended up as one of the best swimmers in the world. Oh, well, thank you, Brian. I, well, I don't know. I wasn't quite as good well, as well, yeah, like, I like you, but it's a fact. <laughs> Damn good. Um, 
I mean, I just never believed that I could. Well, I mean, of course, you all have doubts, but I've always taken someone say I can't do something as a reason to do it. <laughs> Anyone close to me? So it's it's uh, and often it's people closest to you who will tell you it's not possible, and that, that hurts a lot. But you somehow got to just use that to give you the fire to go for it even more. And that's kind of how I've lived my life. And I don't know, it's got me now to be sitting in my own music studio in California, which is, is so off the realms of what I thought could be possible. But it's very much doing that. It's like, okay, it's not possible, Jason. You cannot go to the Olympics as a Kenyan swimmer. You know, don't even think about it. I was like, all right, I've got to try to do this now. That's kind of what it was. <laughs> Listen, man, you can't you can't win a Grammy. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna win a Grammy. <laughs> right now, got the fire. We gotta go for it. <laughs> hey, so what is? I want to talk about some of your technical swimming, though. So, yeah, like, I'm wearing a hat today because my quarantine hair has got really out of control. <laughs> right, I can you out. I'll spot you out, Jason. Come over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Yeah, go you gotta go. you gotta you gotta do some DIY haircuts. You gotta get it done at home. No, I need to get my anyway. We're trying the long hair thing, you know. I might be losing some hair, so it's the last time I'll have a chance to do it potentially in my life. So let's give it a go. Hey, man, I'll live vicariously through you. You know, just keep on. Hey, so what is it about though the you harnessed as a kid? What did you learn technically wise? Who are your influences, the coach or your parents? Like, you know, obviously you you progressed as an athlete to the point that you opened up opportunities for yourself to compete internationally, to move yeah. internationally and swim at one of the best college programs in the world yeah in the US. so what is what is it that like led to that progression can you just talk us through like that your career progression is like a early you know sure so uh yeah we were the three of us boys I was, i'm one of three brothers i was the middle brother and we were within four years of age four, four, within four years and um my dad was a swimmer in kenya actually and he'd come for kenya and he was the first, this is quite interesting, he was the first Kenyan to go under a minute in the 100 freestyle. Wow. Kenyan to go under 50 in the 100 freestyle. So there you go. <laughs> can you, can you still go under a minute? Sorry? Can you go under a minute today? Right now, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Um, Anyway, so, you know, he was very aquatic and he um, he ran a business between Nairobi and Mombasa. Mombasa is a big uh, port city. And it's actually where I think could become the center of swimming for East Africa because you've got real talent. You've got a lot of kids who spend a lot, the ocean's really warm. You've got a lot of ocean swimmers, you know, who are spending a lot of time. And I think with a structure and something in place. So that's, you know, a long term goal for me, potentially one day to set up a center of excellence in the Kenya coast for swimming. Anyway. So he was moving between the, the, the two and you know, a passionate water man, he, you know, he's, he's a surfer. He, he discovered um, wet breaks in, in, off the coast of Mombasa with some buddies. And that was kind of what he started doing for exercise to de-stress as he was running a, a restaurant. He, he has, he's in the hospitality business on the coast. So for him, getting us into uh, comfortable in, wa on, uh, in water early is what he did. And then we went into the Nairobi swim scene and we were doing pretty well. So we were winning our races again compared to age group swimming elsewhere in the world we were very far behind still but he would start looking outside to get resources so that you know we could try to open our eyes and one of the things he got was some vhs tapes by richard quick and skip kenny who were the stanford coaches when i was like i must be like eight and we'd put these things on and watch richard quick and skip kenny talking about stroke technique and whatever and then we go into go to the pool and try to mimic what they were telling us on these old VHS tapes. But it was his practice to think, like, how can I source some stuff? I know, you know, there was not real internet. I don't even know how he went about getting those. But he had a, he had, I think he had a friend in, his friend from the US would send him stuff. There was this American guy who used to travel and they became buddies. So, anyway. So that was kind of that. And, uh, but then Sorry, we to this day, I can hear Richard saying, hold the line. <laughs> I got swim for Richard for a year, and when you were talking about your personal brand, the memory that I have about him is that he was so good at accepting compliments. 
rest in peace, future. He's just like an artist that you tell him he's the best college swim coach in history, and he says thank you very much. And it's like you know, it's like you don't. Most people don't accept that. Anyway, carry on. It's some big names you mentioned. Yeah. So, um, but then uh, you know, my, my parents uh, wanted to send us to boarding school for high school. And we went to a school called Marlborough College in, in the UK. But, it, you know, they were toying. It, ultimately, it was my older brother's decision where to go. And we'd just follow him as a few younger brothers. And at the time, well, all of us were a little bit uncertain if swimming was a path we'd take. Again, there were all these things about, you know, you can't really make it as a Kenyan swimmer, blah, blah, blah. Where, where are you going? So the school we went to wasn't known for its swimming at all. Hmm. And, you know, we could have chosen there are other schools in the UK that, are very known for their swimming and we potentially could have been sent to one of those but we weren't and the first few years of high school i swam on the school team but i wasn't thinking it was gonna be something i'd pursue but you know i was starting to get stronger just naturally as you develop as, at that age and my times are dropping so that was exciting i'm not really training like i was in nairobi but my times are getting better what's going on so and then it took a coach there who'd swum at the university of georgia under jack barley and he was a business studies teacher at the school. He wasn't a trained swim coach, but he kind of took on the role of swim coaching because he'd swum for Great Britain. He'd been a 400 IM. -er. He'd narrowly missed the Olympic team. He'd been in the top three in the world in the 400 IM. He's a guy called Peter Sullivan. And so he saw me swim and he's like, you are, you, you have something here. I mean, you're not training like other swimmers are training and you're doing pretty well. I think I qualified for uh, English school, the English schools team for my region on the back of not really training like a swimmer. So then he's like, if you really want to think about this, there's this option to go. He had someone in the NCAA, so he knew what that was like. And so he's the one who opened my mind to like, oh, maybe there is this option there. Because I was thinking university probably in the UK. And that's kind of how that I started getting that consciousness about what might be possible and doing the research and all that stuff of how I could get to a college in the US. Mm. Yeah, so, but that's still a big step. So you take yeah. the step from from the UK, what sort of, um, I mean, did you know where you wanted to go? You had the VHS tapes, was, did you have Stanford posters on the wall? <laughs> like, so, what was the next step like? Yeah, so not really. So, okay, I started doing this and I was starting to represent Kenya. So my first international meet, like senior competition was the World Championships in 2004 in Indianapolis. Uh -huh. And Skip Kenny was the coach of the US team there. But I mean, at that point, I kind of and my parents have friends in California. So for them, sending me so far, like going so far from home, it was kind of like they felt maybe there's a little bit more of a safety net if it was in California where they knew people. So I was very focused on looking at California schools um, and looked at Cal and Stanford as my options and applied to them. And with the idea that like, oh, OK, if I don't get in, then maybe I'll take a gap here, try again and, and kind of explore schools throughout the country was, I think, kind of the thought process there. And then, you know, I got accepted to Stanford, so decided to come on over. <laughs> yeah. Jason, I got a question. I remember when you did a workout of us, and I remember how, how weak you were in, in the weight room, yeah. <laughs> quite, quite frankly. I was like, are you joking? We're, we're strong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 yes, yeah, compared to an old man like me, how did the guy who who was you know weak with weights and then then i saw you swim afterwards i'm like ah oh, you're just so uh, how do you go 19 0 in short course yards i just saw that time how do you go out at 23 5 and come back in 51 1. what was it about that made jason dunford really good at swimming and freestyle and fly you think are you gonna take that <laughs> yeah no kidding if I, if I go to the gym with like a george Bavel or a, i don't know some of these other guys Miller and Kavich, or these other guys that I trained with later, or even the guys on the standard team, like Danuel and Tobert. Uh, exactly. I mean, I, I think I had pretty good strength to weight ratio, but certainly I'm a smaller guy. So, like, you know, definitely did not have the all out power of some of my competitors. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was about stroke and finesse and just really trying to, um, you know, have the perfect stroke because I knew as a smaller guy in the world of swimming, that's where it would have to be for me. I couldn't rely on becoming a six foot five, six foot six giant, because I'm 5'11", you know? 
by normal standards in the normal population, I'm not a tiny guy, but in the film world, I was very small. <laughs> no, it's because yeah. we talked to Duid Ragania and Nathan Adrian, and there's such contrasting <laughs> styles and physiques and <laughs> methods. And and so, yeah, you know, and you felt more like a Dewey, more like a guy who had a perfect technique and, and paid attention. I mean, he he's a nice technique, technique too. I'm not saying him. Sorry? Okay. Dewey's quite a bit, lot bigger than I am. Yeah, but he's not, he's just so lanky. And you're like yeah. that, you have that lanky strength. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like you, you, you have what you swam big. You know, you see yeah. people that, that just, they may not be the biggest guys in the pool or the biggest gals in the pool, but they swim big. You were one of those guys who appeared a lot bigger in the water than maybe when you stand on the pool deck next to your competitors. So well, my wingspan is six. Four. So it's quite a lot. Wow. Yeah. What? Yeah. So I'm five eleven, but my wings tan. I've I've got long arms. So That's crazy. Yeah. Jeez, man. <laughs> That's crazy. So what do you think that you did? What do you think that you did technically well? Like, what is it that progressed your career? Um, what did you learn? What are some of the keys that, like, eventually you figured out, and that's what made you go fast? So butterfly was the upkick. Really, just you know, keeping that up kick going and going <laughs> that up kick going. That was one of the things that happened at Stanford. It was very much doing a lot of dolphin kicking on my back to try to get that up kick because then you're working with gravity and it's not quite as taxing. So that was big. But then I did um, kicking was big for me, just really getting those legs strong. And I did a lot of freestyle kicking with the board as well, flutter kick with the board. Um, from a technique point of view, I mean, butterfly, we used to do, you know, these twenties in the diving well that I used to do with skip and it was the diving is shorter than the, of course, the regular pool we're training in. And the idea was to make everyone perfect each time, same amount of kicks, same amount of strokes, hit the wall perfectly each time. So it was just really trying to perfect it. And I didn't do a lot of butterfly training. I wasn't one of these guys who could crank off sets of butterfly, like some like teammates did you know they would do ridiculous butterfly sets and i was like nah that's not for me i will train my freestyle i'll, I'll use freestyle to really do the hard sets and then butterfly if i'm doing butterfly i want to be doing butterfly perfectly it's kind of how i approached it i mean that's not to say i didn't do hardish hard butterfly sets but it wasn't like it was always trying to be quality when i saw them fly i think it was a lot about it yeah, I feel like there's a lot of flyers that are like that, especially sprint flyers where they are obviously working on the technical aspect and doing more speed work. But as far as volume, it just, you know, their strokes will deteriorate. They just can't hold the technique. Is that how your, your training was too, Brian? Were you similar to that? Yeah, I mean, I never touched butterfly um, and somehow ended up going 22 and a 50 fly. And I, I didn't swim the 100, but like I never trained butterfly. I would only do it fast. Or I would yeah. maybe do like some drill work. And the drill to this day that always felt the best for me, warming up for butterfly. And I ended up doing this warming up for a lot of uh, strokes was um, dolphin underwater dolphin kick on my back with a little skull. And for whatever reason, that helped me feel the water on all sides. And then it really translated well mentally for me swimming butterfly on top of the water. But but I would imagine, like, you have to do – if you're going to swim the 100, you have to be able to do some of the, the longer stuff, understand that you're not doing it all the time, but you have to do some of that to finish the, finish the 100 fly. Um, you know, and I think, you know, even for somebody powerfully as you, as you swam it, right? Yeah, and maybe I should have done more longer stuff. <laughs> it would have helped <laughs> better. <laughs> I don't know, man. 51 low is pretty good. Definitely. Yeah. John, how come you asked me that question? I broke a minute and hundred fly. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I'm breaking a minute, hundred yards. <laughs> we don't need to worry about that. Oh, come on. <laughs> What's your time, Luke? Hundred fly, long course. Yes. <laughs> Dude, I did some USRPT the other day, and I, I tried to swim some butterfly in that, and uh, it's just, it's just so brutal. Now I'm telling you, like. That's one of the things that I think swimming more than a lot of other sports, this is strange to me. I think that, well, we talked about like maintaining strength and being away from the pool and Jason, you're like, I don't know if I can go and break a minute today. Maybe I could like long course is pretty yeah, hard. For a while. I mean, 
you know, like you have this mix of if you maintain the strength, then you can come back to it later. Um, so maybe there's still an opportunity for you in your career. But, uh, but, but on the flip side, some of the aerobic component, like so the, the feel for the water is just so important within swimming. And it's just kind of bizarre. It's a bit of an anomaly, I think, in the sporting world where it's like that critical that you just touch the water. You know, I mean, we go and do wake up. Oh, swim. Yeah. yeah. Like, did you guys do wake up swims? Yeah, in in before at meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, there. I was about a twenty-five. Uh, and I don't know. I didn't know what that was before I got to college, but we would do. I mean, so you'd get up early in the morning, go to yeah. the pool, put yeah. on a swim. The distance swimmers might do like five hundred, or crazy people would yeah. even do space yeah. work. A lot of the sprinters would do like a twenty-five. As yeah. like a badge of honor, like I got in, but I only did a 25. I'm ready to race, but anyway, you get in the pool and wake up. And I'm an early bird, so I kind of liked that. But yeah, I don't know. This is too weird I mean, things about it. You feel in alternative training techniques. I mean, I'm like you said, swimming. Obviously, you need more time, maybe more exposure, just to keep that feel. Do you guys think trying to train three times a day with really low volume? would have improved one's ability to have better feel for the water and maintain it? Or you think the mental burnout would just be so extreme going to the pool three times a day? Well, I don't. Come on, super trainers, let's hear it. Yeah, that would be a lot. It was a lot as it is. I don't know. I suppose it would be you just manage your life differently, potentially. I don't know. Well, what's Christmas training like at Stanford? I don't know how it is now, but yeah, in my time it was it was pretty it was rough. <laughs> we used to do a uh, the the one thing that's memorable is on New Year's Day we'd do a five thousandth of time the whole team. I'm sorry, that's yeah. not present. So that was one memorable aspect of it. And then yeah, there were a lot of hard sets. I mean, it was the most volume I would do through the year during that week. Um, it was very focused on volume uh, when I did it in the pool as opposed to a lot of land-based activity. Which right. the sprint we do a lot more of that at other points in the seasons, but uh, during Christmas training, everyone's just pounding, pounding the water. But yeah, man, man, I haven't thought about this stuff in a while. That was I, I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have a drink, have some tea. <laughs> yeah. That was a, yeah, wow. <laughs> It's all right, so, man. You don't have to. The Stanford that you brought with you is that red jacket, the Cardinal oh, yeah. jacket. Oh, I've got. If I turn this around, you can see. Oh, there it is. There you go. Oh, oh there it is. Uh, yeah, you had the you had the party in the front. Now there you go. So, so Jason, I want to talk about uh, in in Kenya. I mean, crazy sports country. I mean, you yeah. you, you guys are known for track obviously and, and and marathon running you guys are known for cricket uh almost as good as west indies yeah <laughs> you know for soccer rugby even sevens i mean yeah. all, i mean all, all that stuff and 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 but not swimming we talked about this earlier yeah i mean yeah. what what does the average kenyan think about this white these two white kenyans who swam on the world stage do you do you know anybody who might be able to give a commentary on like the average kenyan's perspective on that well, was, this, guy, this guy's certainly not an average Kenyan, though. Oh, who is he? What? Uh, he might be able to. He might be able to give a perspective. Because Drop him on. Oh my god. <laughs> so, do you want me to introduce him? Do you like bring him on the show? Yeah, introduce who? Who are we about to see? All right. So this guy. So uh, you know, as you discussed, I'm, I've I've been doing a lot of music now. This guy is one of the most legendary guys of all time. So he is the most toured artist to ever come out of Kenya with his band, him and his band. Um, he's called uh, Justo Asikoye and he founded a band with his brother Josek called Jabali Africa, which means the rock of Africa. And talk about guys who are like bucking the trend of pursuing a dream at a time when, you know, not necessarily they were getting the most support. So this was the early 90s when they decided they were going to be musicians. And there was a lot of, not a very big professional music scene in, in Kenya at that point. And they just went for it. And they ended up 
getting to Europe, touring around Europe, coming to the US. They were on tour in the US for the last 20 plus years. They played in every one of the lower 48. These guys have done over a million miles driving around, touring in the US. He, um, they one year played 250 shows in a year. <laughs> you know, that's like insane. So in terms of musical genius, he's, he's amazing. And as I was getting into music in Nairobi and I was doing a show with uh, Romantico, we, we had been invited to come to a show. He came along to check out because he's, he's gone back to Nairobi, set up a place called the Culture Hub to nurture creatives in Nairobi and, and try to build an industry up around, around um, the arts in Kenya because it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's growing. But, you know, there's a lot of potential there for the youth to get employment, et cetera, and develop a lot. So he's back there now. He came along and he saw what we're doing. He's like, guys, you should come to studio. Or maybe we can do something together. Anyway, we've been vibing ever since. And, you know, we're working on our 20th track together. We've released a full album. I was featured on his most recent album. Jabali Africa have released eight, I think maybe 10 albums, eight, eight to 10 albums. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just feel honored that I get to work with him uh, right now, day in, day out. And, uh, you know, we're on Zoom all the time. We're now separated by distance, but we were working together a lot in the studio, um, you know, just a few months ago. So here he is. This is uh, live from Nairobi. Yes, sir. <laughs> Welcome, Jesus. I got mine here. I just finished. Uh, what are you drinking? Your tea? Yeah, Kenyan, Kenyan lemon tea. Nice, <laughs> nice. Some ginger, you know, the tree that stuff, you know. <laughs> I just have the audience know it's 4 45 a.m. in the morning on Friday in Kenya right now for live from Nairobi, and we got a legend of, of music here. The, yeah. the, tell us, how did you hear about Jason Dunford? What's the first time you saw this guy or, 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 or heard about his name? Tell me. <laughs> this guy <laughs> is a long story. Tell me. We got all day. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, his father owned um, a restaurant, a, a club, actually, a very prime venue till today in Nairobi called uh, The Carnival. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hosted at one time, actually, it was the first Kenyan star search. And they organized it. And then we heard about it while, you know, because we, we started, Japan Africa started at the National Theater. Yes. So we were looking for gigs and we heard about that star search going on after six months of formation. Then uh, we saw the carnival was advertised because the carnival has been prime for over 40 years. Over 40 years has been like the best venue in Kenya. So we went there and uh, we enrolled, became number one in every every uh, heat, you know, every group that they put us. So that's where we started. And uh, we knew the father, we, we know the old man. And then at that time, Jason was a very tiny guy, you know, running around, you know, I, his big brother used to come all over the place, you know, there were three. And uh, yeah, and that was it. Then we went to Europe with a guy called Alan Donovan. He's got the best house, I think, in East Africa. And uh, the house is very culturally uh, culturally rich. So Jason Dunford, when I went to the States, uh, we had about this, who is this Musungu? Musungu is a, is a white man. Yeah. <laughs> he was terrorizing the Americans. And we were like, what? A Kenya? <laughs> <laughs> so we, were like, we were like every time during that Olympics. I remember I was living in Baltimore, and I was like, "No, that's the guy. That's the son of the owner of the carnival." You mean you guys that we used to see? But Jason was at it again. We said, "Man, the, the guy again won." And this guy, he must be good because uh, uh, for Kenya, we were not used to swimmers. We've never been used to that, and we never even had interest. Jason Danford, Samaki Muku brought that back again. Yeah. And people, he brought the focus back to swimming. Because we are known, like the way uh, Luke said, we are known for track and field. We used to be known for boxing, but mm -hmm. during the 90s, a lot of our, our athletes, you know, sometimes when the government doesn't take care of, of athletes, they, they go for other stuff, you know, they try to look for or seek for the professional uh, professional uh, uh, revenue yeah. uh, really stuff. 
like Wangila, our first, the first gold medalist in boxing. He died in Las Vegas. Remember? He died in yeah. Las Vegas without insurance and all that stuff because he could not, he was retired, but he could not fight until, you know, he was doing it now for survival because there was nothing else he could do. When you spend your professional life yeah. into something, when they when you get out of it, you can even die from depression. Yeah. Yes, it's easy. Okay. So Jason, we heard about it. Then, okay, I forgot about it. Then when I came to Kenya, uh, I saw it first, I saw their video, and I was like, this is the, other, this is the same swimmer. That dude <laughs> now is now singing. And <laughs> Yeah, and I saw him with a big, big Mexican. And I was like, these guys are singing. So again, I brushed it off. Okay. Then I came to Kenya and uh, one of my friends was meeting his wife at a local hotel somewhere here on off Mombasa Road. And Jason actually remembered me because I could not remember like when did I see you? Did I see you in well, that was before I'd even got into music, Gusto. That was back in 2017 when we met. <laughs> Yeah, and but I was like, oh, well, you, know, you, you I didn't recognize you straight off. But I was like, you like, yeah, Jabalia. I'm like, whoa. And so I was, I was big fanboy. I was like, I can't believe if I was sitting with him and he was telling me about his plans to come back. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I had no concept of going into music at that point. I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked you. Remember, I asked you, where did I see you? I didn't know you were at Stanford because we normally crisscross California, San Francisco, and yeah, you uh, you're uh, in California, haven't you? Yeah, I was. We were crossing all over Stanford, and we could remember Alan Donovan because he went to Stanford. He's an yeah. alumni. You know that, right? Yeah, Alan Donovan, an American guy. So his story is he, an American guy, went to West Africa as a as a diplomat in the '60s, and then left the diplomatic service, uh, bought a VW van, and drove across Africa, ending in the east, and decided to settle there and build a house. So there's a there's an African heritage house that this guy built. Anyway, he was very yeah. involved in promoting Jabali out to the world and taking them on that some of their first tours around. But you know, Justo was crisscrossing California, playing at reggae on the river, all these big festivals that were happening around here. So Justo, Justo tell me something. What was it like for you to to so you knew Jason, you knew his dad, you knew his family. What was it like for you as a Kenyan to see Jason march on to the opening ceremonies Olympics holding your flag? Man, we were, like we were happy about it. We were very happy and excited about it because we never had a medal in swimming. And we saw we saw that this guy was terrorizing people, he was giving people uh <laughs> their money, and we were like, man. This guy is Kenya. First, I thought he was Zimbabwean. There was a Zimbabwean. There was another Muslim yeah, from Zimbabwe. Kirsty Coventry. Yeah, you beat him, right? Did no, you? They had a woman. No, there were some South Africans. Yeah, there was South Africans. Yeah, and we were like, man, we finally had a Kenyan in a sport that never was never even we never even had uh, uh, hopes in swimming. So, and we liked it because he brought back the medals from the Olympics. Well, not because the Olympics. Fifth of the Olympics, but Caldwell said all Africa. <laughs> Man, <laughs> Which uh, go does, ahead. Does, does your son have dreams that he can do well in anything now? I mean, I mean, I'm sure when you grew up, you didn't think swimming crossed your mind. But does you mentioned your son earlier? I don't know how old he is, but does he have you know? Does he believe that he can now maybe even do anything for Kenya? But how yeah, did he influence the young yeah. people? Yeah, he's eight years old, and uh, we are drawing a lot. You know, I used to draw a long time ago. And it brought me back to that because this quarantine time, actually, I'm really enjoying uh, drawing. I used to draw a long time before I got into other. I used to be multi-talented. So mm -hmm. I quit that. And even in music, I found myself in music accidentally. So uh, my son, because right now, because I've been here two years and I was hoping to be there this summer, he had already arranged for an event, actually, that we wanted to do with Jason for kids. At, uh, at the carnival, because the carnival is next to the national park. So yeah. we want to do something, kids in the park, enjoy the park, the animals, and then come back to the carnival, because it's just next door. And uh, my kid always draws, and he loves music. All this music that we've been doing with Jason, and I, I told him, I normally send them to him. He's eight years old, but he told me, oh, no, daddy, yeah, I like that one most. He liked uh, Tengisha Juele. 
Uh, so I like that song too. Like that. Maybe. Yeah, but, I like it rendition, maybe. Yeah, I like it wrong, but he went back and said, I love all of them, but I like that one the most. So you need to teach this this young man how to how to sing and, and all your expertise. Is he gonna help your son to swim? Does your son want to oh, swim? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, oh, definitely. You know, kids try everything. He's right now in TV, so he's actually shaped that. And uh, I'm hoping we'll get to meet at one point. I'd love to. I'd love to do something with him. Yeah, once I, once I come to the States, I'm going to come with him to California. Yeah. Because, you know, we're there. We, we can come a bunch of us. But yeah. uh, COVID thing, man, is just, we just messed up everything this whole year. But <laughs> I was supposed to be there this summer. Uh, today, because I do a lot of kids' programs too in America. I've done the most shows, man. Man, we've, we've done a lot of shows in America. Plenty. I know each and every highway. I can drive from East Coast to California yeah, without inside. <laughs> hey, you hey, know? hey, Justo, you're an athlete. Didn't you start off at the Kenyan National Theater as a dancer? Or were you a dancer in the Kenyan National Theater? So that's yeah. quite an athlete, an athlete right? Wow. You and your yeah. brother. So yeah. was that your, your athlet, you, that and your, your instruments, your voice, that was your two big things, your dancing and your music, yeah? Yeah, but actually, <laughs> the way I found myself in music, I was not going to do music for a living. But when I chose music, I was passing by the National Theatre because Joseph, they had come, they, their school was very good at uh, uh, drama festivals, music festivals. I had music in me. Because the guitar, I played it. My dad taught me because he was a musician. My dad was a musician, but he never believed in music because during their days, music never paid. So he was like, "No, I want you. I want you to pursue electronics." Uh, I, I was, I was, I rejected a scholarship. Me and my brother in Philadelphia, and uh, <laughs> my father could not believe it. This guy, he could not believe that he could. He didn't want to see any. Music wow. instrument in front of him. So the way I ended up uh, at the National Theatre was just running away from the free time yeah. that we had after high school. For you know, normally you know you want to do other stuff while you're still discovering yourself. Then we ended up at the National Theatre. I'm like, oh, dancing is fun. So we started dancing, and Joseph pulled me in. I was not going there to dance, and my dad could not even take it. They said two sons doing music. <laughs> but yeah, to your point about his his athletic background, I mean that 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 shows us are so high energy. It's insane. It, Just the drumming. I mean, Juice. You, I mean, you, you used to hit the gym every day when you were on the road, right? <laughs> man, Kenya has wasted me. Look at me. I used to hit the gym every day. Yeah, you got it, man. Yeah. I want to go back. I want to go back. I cannot do it anymore. So, so Jason and Justo, I I said this in one of our promos. Social kick. Justo, social kick is at the end of a hard workout, a hard exercise. We just yeah. like to relax and we talk and we have fun and we're just talking. And sometimes the coach puts music on. And yeah. it's so beautiful when there's music playing and we can just talk. We never had music on a social kick before and it's about time. Oh, yeah. There's always right. a for everything. Always. Yeah, there's always a first time. I'm ready. I got my Trinidad Shack Shack. I got my steel pan. He's got a foam roller. What do you want us to drink? Bang his coffee cup or something. Or yes, <laughs> no, um, so, yeah, so what we're going to do, so actually, I just want to, before we get into it, so we actually are working together now on an ex another sort of Zoom experience, and it's online through Airbnb. It's part of the Airbnb Olympics Festival. A lot of other Olympians involved. Um, so we do like a musical journey through Kenya, introduce people to Kenyan culture through music, kind of take you on an online journey. Obviously, it's not quite the same as being there in physical form, but we try to think of it as a good proxy. And it's really good for kids, especially, you know, if you're looking for something interesting, educational as well. So that's a shout out for that. And the, the, the proceeds that go to support Juice's work in Nairobi with the Culture Hub that is supporting a lot of young creatives um, in Kenya. And he's developing a lot of really talented guys. But anyway, we're going to give you a little bit of a rendition of one okay, of our... Okay, dressed in my African shirt. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, looking good, Luke. All right, let's do it. we got to go to part. Let's do it. So, uh, well, how about we get Juice to, to give us... Well, we should go... We'll go with the, we'll go with the chorus. Juice, I love you. 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 I love you.
Which we are not finding in the alcohol. Oh, oh, to find a tingi shanuele. Oh, tingi shanuele. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. <laughs> And here we go with a bit of the freestyle rap. It goes something like this. Mwamba mukasi karatasi afadhali unipe nafasi we ni amasi mimi ni alasi basi nitazo anga kiasi changa na radi inabuni glasi ama wende ngarasi katika risasi show me no mercy test me best me go to dinner rest me who can provide me will be carefree across the bahari kunda samiati swati bati fija bati upati au Bila bahati, nina mkakati wa harakati Ni wakati kuinua mabati Siski kumati ongeza nishati Lepo kumwana wea here to party Nisha nyole Nisha nyole acha mpole Nisha nyole acha mpole Wewe mrembo Mama yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That's a little bit of what it's like. <laughs> wow, Boom. Wow. That was awesome. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> so, exp- can you explain what you're singing about? What, 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 what the, 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 the song is beautiful. What are you singing, Jason? So what is it about? Actually, Jason came up with the hook. Yeah, I uh, wrote it. He came but, up with the English anyway. Yeah, so when we first got to the studio, uh, yeah. he had this beat on, and the, the beat's really full in the in the original version, and he had this thing going on, I was like trying to find what we write on it, and I, the Tingi Shanuela is, is, is kind of a party song, so it means throw your hair around, let your hair down, Acho pole, don't be shy, and Wewen Mrembo, you're so beautiful, so that's kind of the, the what well, we have the hook for this song, so it's it's all about you know, letting your hair down once in a while and enjoying the company of that other special person in your life. You know, uh, that's that's something we all need to pay attention to and just do, it, dude. Absolutely, Brian. You got anything? Yeah. I will. Uh, I just wanted to, Jason. Um, we had a question from the audience, so Justin was going to yeah. ask it for you. Oh well, from Carlene herself. Tisha wants to know who is. <laughs> His favorite passive coach. Oh, my club team. I'm not <laughs> political on this at all. Uh, you're all amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I got to swim with, well, with Tony, obviously, I got to swim with Tisha. I don't know if I ever swam with you, but we definitely did some programming together for some kids. And then, uh, of course, there was Ricky back, back then when I was swimming. And uh, it's a great program. What can I say? Pass <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, there we go. Well, the first time we can't forget Carleen now that I've met her. So. There you go. Good well, job. Hey, once uh, what? Once COVID's over, well, you're in the you're in the Bay Area, but do so when you can make it back out to California. We got to hang out, man. We gotta we gotta do some athletic stuff, yeah. and we gotta get together for yeah. music. Yeah. Stuff. I think. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, Jason. And- we got a, we got a couple of rapid fire questions for you to close it out. So, uh, for me, or the- oh, sorry, sometimes I get mixed. Huh? Who is it for? Me or Justo? Oh, I'll call it out. Most of them for you, but okay. we got a couple for Justo too. So, for you, Jason, what's the hardest race in swimming? Four hundred IM. 
Are sprinters tougher than distance swimmers? No. <laughs> which <laughs> instrument which instrument is next on your list to incorporate into your sound? Ooh, that's a good one. I leave that to do stuff. Maybe clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, steel pan, oh, Jason. Oh, steel oh, pan. Is it the Indian sitar? That thing is amazing. A lot of, uh, a lot of scales, man. The pan. The pan. To both of you guys, where where did you get inspiration for any movements in your music videos? If you're dancing, where who's who are your inspirations? Man, for me, I did professional dance. I did more than a traditional. I like doing my my own dances. Uh -huh. We were the first big dancers in Kenya <laughs> during the Utna, and it went like that. But we say dancing was not bringing in the, enough revenues. We switched to music. But I've been I've been dancing all my life. Even up today, I can dance, but not as good as the way I used to. But I can tell you, uh, the, I love. I love doing my original choreography. That's what Jabali we normally do. Oh, well, Justo, how would you rate Samaki's dance moves? I'm still gonna put him into training. <laughs> <laughs> I know he can swim. He can, he can swim. Samaki does. Oh, the back. 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 Oh, the uh, Jason, who's the competitor that motivated you? Sorry, the competitor that motivated me. Yeah. Uh, Michael Phelps. Justo, <laughs> right. what's something that Sumaki has improved on as a musician? Oh, I can tell you, uh, he's really improved. Uh, especially, I was about to tell him uh, the keys. He's really very much into keys because he normally sends me his stuff and I mix it here. And I noticed that thing, you know, he's very much, he's into key. He's in key, completely. In key. Wow. And even confidence too. Yeah. And the confidence. Yeah. He's a warrior. This guy's a warrior. Grand warrior. Big fish. <laughs> he's, he's not a joke. <laughs> that I know. <laughs> Jason, what what did you learn, if anything, from elite Kenyan runners? Hmm. I think keeping things simple, especially at competition. You'll be with these guys, and you know they just was so unfazed by everything that was going on around. I, somehow I'd get overawed. I'd be at the Olympics, I'd be at the Commonwealth Games, or whatever. And I'd go, wow, look at this! And I would get in my own head. But I think I learned from them that you know just another day at the office kind of thing. So like, whatever, we're here to have a good time and relax. And I'm sure I, maybe that's, you know, what I was, the vibe I was getting, but also yeah, just the ability to step up and win all the time. It was amazing to watch. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. But I think um, it's a little bit of a proxy to US swimming because it, Kenya's so dominant in running, you kind of have that group as well. You know, that team feeling on, on like on when yeah. I see the US team on deck, you know, as, as you're swimming from a small nation, there's that, there's that, I don't know. The U.S. just has that on the swimming deck, and I think Kenya has that around the running track. Yeah, so Kenya's got that swagger. Yeah, you know, it's the preeminent country. You're proud to wear those colors. They've got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that must come with confidence. What What advice would you give Jason to up and coming swimmers in a non traditional swimming country uh, who are trying to make it? Uh, what advice would you give to them? Stick with it, you know, commit to the journey. Uh, you're going to feel beat down. There's going to be ups and downs. But uh, the only way you can see if you can do it is if you stick with it. My dad had a phrase he used to say to us, if you don't go, you won't know. So you better go. <laughs> I like that. All right. So I got a question for both of you because I will travel to Kenya at some point. So Juto, beside, Jason was drinking black tea from Kenya earlier, and he was mentioning that, but – what is it that nobody really knows about uh, travel to Kenya that we should do? We should make sure that we do when we go. Yeah. Uh, I think, wow, man, Kenya has a lot of diversity until. Jason, what? how old are you? Huh? 
to Peleke, where, where should we take these people? And they come over. I think we should go to Bunyore. No, <laughs> they're going to eat a lot of chicken. Huh? Oh, like, so you still, you still some ancestral hermits out to the west towards <laughs> um, Lake Victoria. Wow. A very fertile country. And of course, Lake Victoria is a massive inland lake. So it's yeah. some amazing scenery in that part of Kenya and underexplored. A lot of the other areas are very um, touristic, but that part of the country is, has got its own magic. Yeah, but there's a place. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a place we normally go every August, but uh, it's in the Rift Valley. I told you about it, uh, Jason. We were trying to to put up a festival by the lake, Lake Baringo. Uh, right? Yeah, we only like to put up packages. We normally go there for hiking. All day we're hiking. By the end of the day, you're dead. Like, but it's a, it's a good feeling. Yeah. That place is untapped. It's very untapped. When you come over, I'm going to take you there. Well, on our way to Bunyore, they go, they're going to make like four stops. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to see. They're going to be ready for a whole week of going to Bunyore. Because we're going to stop in Barino two days like that as we go all the way to Western Kenya. Okay, I love it. Well, that, yeah, so, okay, let's do something in California first. Yeah. And then <laughs> Kenya, and then yeah. you guys can show us all the great spots to get to. And everything will be documented. We're going to make sure we got we document all this stuff. That's Looks our front cool. finger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure we document this stuff because that's what now we're doing, uh, even here. You know, this is awesome. All right. Well, so before I ask you guys to close this out, Chusto. In Jabali, yeah. Africa, where can we follow you? What's the best place to keep up with you and your music? Actually, uh, you can on, on social media, definitely. You know, every, everybody's there. It's, it's a whole village. Uh, Instagram, uh, Roots People Village, you can find like uh, at Jabali, Africa. Of course, we're on Facebook and, and the rest. Uh, Twitter, you know, on YouTube, you can find us. Uh, we still have more stuff coming up. Uh, I can tell you, like, Jabali, when it comes to videos, we did have a lot of presence in videos because during those days we were really perfecting albums. Because the album where you take six months, it's not like nowadays we are quick because of technology, but we were focused mostly on audio. So we've got another album that's gonna be coming out soon, uh, this year. We have a kids' album that we did a lot of tours. I even exited from Oregon, I had to get out of Oregon to come to DC and then come to Nairobi. That time I met Jason. So uh, if you search Jabali Africa and also all the music platforms, you'll find it. And then some other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, it's all over the place. So, yeah. Yeah. The preferred yeah. music consumption channel is. And we have a song that we've recorded called Kale Kale Bonge, which Justo wrote and is inspired by swimming and me as a swimmer. And it's it's got the samaki dance in it, which is doing all the stuff. <laughs> I have no idea how we should end the show. Do you have any idea how we should end the show, Brian? John, Justin, how should we end the show? I think you want to hear some of it. I think so. Let's hear it. I don't know. We haven't practiced this one live. You guys, have that's all. It. That's perfect. You want to Give us a verse and a chorus. Give us a wake verse up, and a chorus. Wake up, swim. Wake up, swim. Are you saying okay? We got to do single source sound because it's kind of hard across two locations. Just go, Anza Kuimba, Imba. Another thing, a cappella here. Yeah, a cappella. I'm going to get over there. go back and over down. Oh yeah, he's going to get a drum to get this going. Actually, yeah. Do you have a jamba there or something else? I got a conga here. Oh, conga. All right. Yeah. Kale <laughs> <laughs>
Before you go, in Swahili, did Justo, Jason, did you, what's the best part about swimming? Is it a social kick? Sorry, say it in Swahili. Yeah, I mean, I mean, did, did you enjoy the social kick? Give me, you know, oh. is, is social kick like this, like a, a good thing for this? Oh, yeah. The social so kick is good. The energy is good. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a healthy, healthy talk, you know. Yeah, in Swahili. Oh, in Swahili. When I don't know to the summer to Nakushukuru Sana, could you walk up a lao? Yes, to Nakutakia or Kati Mwema. Nice, I have to be Jabba, but she could have turned it. You still have something else. Give us something in Luya, actually. Say something in Luya. So, Justo is multilingual, he can speak like five languages. Give us something else. Bilembe. Bilembe is uh, greetings, and Hembo Munanono is like, thank you very much. Who 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 Buno for this for for this opportunity of hosting us. Thank you very much, Hembo Munanono Nyasai Abadinde. It's like. God bless you or God protect you. Right on. Well, thanks for having thanks, thanks for being here, guys. That was awesome. Uh, we look forward to jamming out with your music on the boat. It's going to be great. But when we can get back together in person, let's do that. Until then, uh, that's it for this episode of the Social Kick podcast. We'll see you guys. Thanks. Thank you.